be talking about particles interaction and wave turbulence. So I'll try to explain in this talk most of the words of the title, starting with turbulence actually, and then moving back to wave turbulence and then particles and interaction. And I'll try to explain that uh, turbulence is too hard to study, at least for me. So I moved to wave turbulence, which could be a bit easier, but that's also too hard. So then I moved to particles and interaction, which is slightly easier, but also quite hard. But I'll try to explain all of this in, in this uh, lecture. Okay, so let's start with fluid tur turbulence. Can we define fluid turbulence? What is it? Um, so actually, to help me with this, I asked, in some sense, Horace Lamb, a very famous mathematician, wrote a lot of books about physics uh, in particular. And one day he addressed, uh, I think, a community of British uh, scientists or mathematicians. And he told them, I'm an old man now, and when I die and go to heaven, there are two matters on which I hope for enlightenment. One is quantum electrodynamics, and the other is the turbulent motion of fluids. About the former, I am really rather optimistic. So uh, he's telling you quantum electrodynamics is very hard, but he hopes God will explain that. The turbulent motion of fluids, he's not really sure that God will be able to explain that. Okay, so I'm not God, I'm not Horace Lamb, I'm not going to explain turbulence. But what I'd like to do is just try to show you what we understand by the word turbulence and why it's so hard to describe from a mathematical point of view. So here's just a small video I found on the internet where you have a, a fluid which is moving past a cylinder. So you just see it from above right now. So you have the cylinder, right? And the fluid moving past it. And so what you can see is that the particles of fluid are in some regions of the space, very smooth, laminar fluid, laminar flow. And somewhere, some places are very, very rough, right? The particles are going in all kinds of crazy directions. So turbulent flow means in particular that some particles of fluids will have a very, very hard to follow movement. On the other hand, you can see some structures that seem to be quite stable in some sense, right? So you have those big type of patches which seem to be uh, macroscopic, much larger than the particles and seem to have some kind of a stable structure. So some characteristics of a flow are very hard to follow. Some seem to be reproducible in the sense that you could see those structures creating, moving around, but always there in some sense, okay? Another way of seeing this, so those pictures are taken from the book by Uriel Frisch, who's a very, very good on, book on turbulence. And another way of understanding it, that some characteristics of a flow are reproducible, although the flow is very complicated, is to draw a histogram. So let me just explain in a few words what that means. So this is a, a picture of which uh, is just depicting nothing in particular, but just pretend you have an experiment and you're measuring the velocity of particles in your experiment as a function of time. So this is velocity zero here. And then you see the velocity is, is moving like crazy around the value zero. Sometimes it's very high, sometimes it's very low, and it's oscillating around this value zero in a very unpredictable way. So it looks like at least, okay? And then on the right-hand side, you have the histogram. You're computing how many times you had this or that value of velocity. For instance, here, you have a very high velocity. But that happened never, right? N is zero. Then as velocity goes down, you actually have more and more occurrences of those velocities. And at the end, this is the zero velocity and that happened the most often, okay? So this is a histogram. Now let's see this in a real example, again, taken from the book of uh, Frisch. So it's an experiment where you're looking at a wind tunnel and measuring the velocity in some, in some way and at two different times. So this was for a certain number of uh, minutes, let's say, and then four seconds later, they started again. Okay, and what you can see from those pictures is that the velocity again is oscillating in a crazy way and you can't see any precise pattern, right? Sometimes it's zero quite often, sometimes it's very large, sometimes it's very small. And then four seconds later here, thinking, things which are very different are happening. Okay, so it looks like the velocity is oscillating like crazy and not in a predictable way. But if you compute the histogram, so you count how many times you had the velocity uh, zero, you see that happened about 800 times and that was the same in the second experiment. And actually you see those curves, both curves are essentially identical. So the velocity does very crazy things when you measure it at every second, but in the end, the size of the velocity is, has the same pattern for both experiments. So this is uh, something you can 
see in a turbulent flow is that the flow looks very hard to follow. If you look at each part uh, particle, for instance, but some properties of the flow seem to be the same, whatever happens. Another thing you can uh, compute, so this picture, you can't find it anywhere. I just drew it by hand, right? So don't, it's not explaining anything in, in real life, but that's a typical picture you can find if you measure uh, something I'll be explaining later on, the energy spectrum in terms of the wave number. So if you don't know what the wave number is, don't worry, I'll tell you in about five minutes. But for the moment, just look at this picture and it's telling you that for very, very large wave numbers, you don't really know what's happening. Things seem to be dropping. For small wave numbers, you're not too sure, but in between for average wave numbers, which we call the inertial range, inertial, sorry about the typo, then this looks like a straight line, okay, in a log-log scale. That means that actually the energy spectrum behaves like a power law. And that's something that you see in very, very many experiments. So this is again taken by an, in Frisch's book. He, you don't really have to read what's written here at all, but all those, uh, all this text here is telling you there were lots of experiments made at lots of different periods of time in the 60s and 70s, 80s, 90s. And each time at some point, the curve of the energy followed this, this straight line here. Okay, this is known as a, an energy cascade. So the fluid can have a very complicated movement, but you will have this energy cascade at some point if you measure things. Right, so if you want to, to do this in a mathematical way, so for the moment we've seen a video, we've seen pictures, but what, what can you extract from a mathematical way? What you want to do is write down an equation or something and then study the equation and from this equation find the energy uh, cascade or the histogram or whatever from the equation, okay? So how can you write down an equation for a fluid? A fluid you can understand is either a gas or a liquid, like let's say a glass of water. Can I write down an equation explaining how the water is moving in the glass? If I turn my glass a little bit, I, I set it all down on a table, can I write down an equation for the water inside the glass? Well, if you think of what the water is made of, it's made of a a lot, a lot of particles, 10 to the 24. That means you put a one and 24 zeros behind it. It's a, a gigantic number. And that's the number of particles in my glass of water. Okay, and each particle, of course, has to be very, very small to fit into the glass. And each particle is moving, is moving all the time. It's also true in the room wherever you're sitting here right now. Even if the room seems to be perfectly still, there's no wind or anything, each particle in the room around you, around me here, is moving very fast. There are a lot of particles and they're constantly hitting each other and that's the movement of the fluid. So of course what we could do is try to write down an equation for each of the particles and that would be a mathematical way of describing the fluid. Okay, but the problem is there are a lot of particles, that's a lot of equations, but I can write them down if I like. So if I call, if I, I suppose to simplify my particles are just uh, balls, right, so spheres in, in the space, then the center of my sphere I'm going to located by a position called xi. i is the number of my sphere. Let me give a number to each of my particles. And then the time derivative of the position is given by the velocity. That's by definition of the velocity of my particle. And then I decide just to make things very simple here in the slide that each particle is just moving in a straight line with no forcing. So that's the equations of motion of each particle. The only thing is that they're going to collide. So you have a collision rule, which I won't write now, we'll be writing it later on. But that just gives you exactly the picture of your fluid. Each particle is going in a straight line, then they collide, they jump back and they go in another direction. So I have written down mathematically my system. The problem is that I have as many equations as particles, even worse because xi here, each one of these xi's has three coordinates and three space dimensions. Each one of those velocities has three coordinates. So it's just a 10, like 10 to the 30 equations to write. That's much too much. Okay, it's impossible to write down. Especially it's impossible and even it's not really interesting, at least at, from our human point of view, right? Because uh, we're interested, for instance, in knowing what the speed of the wind is. If I'm going outside, there's wind, I wanna know what the speed of the wind is, which has essentially nothing to do in some way uh, with the speed of each individual particle, which made up, uh, which make up the air. Okay, so the, the wind I can feel is not the same. The velocity of the wind is not the same as the velocity of each particle. So actually, I don't really want to know the position and, par and velocity of each particle. What I want to know is what the velocity of whatever air I'm feeling, what that velocity is. 
So in some way, I would like to have some equation above all those 10 to the 30 equations, which tells me exactly what the velocity, the, some kind of average velocity uh, my fluid has and not each of the particles. Okay, so from what we've seen uh, so far, what I understand is the following. First of all, when I look at a fluid flow, it can be very complicated, right? We saw that video, things look very complicated, but it looks like some phenomena are reproducible. So how can I mathematically extract from this very complicated flow some most probable information? What is likely to happen? Okay, how can I do that? I have to average on something. On what should I average? Is it on the data I'm giving? Is it on the time on which I'm doing my, my experiment? So that's one important thing, how to extract what's most probable, what's, what's reproducible. But on the other hand, we could be interested in what's not probable. Like if you're in the, in the sea and suddenly a rogue wave, wave comes to you, you want to be able to anticipate it, and that's not probable. So is there also, on the other hand, a mathematical way of finding not probable information? Okay, so two very different questions, but which are related to uh, turbulence. And then what we also saw briefly is that what we want to understand is what kind of equation can describe a fluid, which would not be the equation for each particle because that's not what's relevant. How can I do that? How can I extract from each the equations on each particle one master equation that would still describe my fluid? On what should I average? And on the other hand, again, how can I understand deviations from this master equation? which could happen, and I want mathematically to have a way of extracting this information also, right? So that's uh, what we would want to do when we, when we look at a fluid, which, which mo most likely will be turbulent. And in some sense, there is good news and bad news. The good news is that there is a master equation, although mathematically we're not totally, uh, we don't have a total proof that this is the master equation, but everyone I think agrees that it should be. And that's a Navier-Stokes equation, which you have in front of you. If you've never seen it before, if you're not um, familiar with the notations in this equation, don't worry, we won't see it again. Or well, maybe once, but we won't be studying it today. So it doesn't matter, you can just look at it as something that's given for you. That's the Navier-Stokes equation. The problem is that this equation, which dates back from the, the mid nineties, uh, 1900, sorry, sorry, 19th century, uh, about 1845. Uh, this equation is not well understood from a mathematical point of view. It's, I won't be talking about this equation today, but it's very hard to solve it. From a mathematical point of view, we're not so sure that it, it is well posed. Whatever that means, we can discuss that later on if you want. So if we don't even know if it's really well posed, how can we extract information like the energy spectrum? That looks very, very hard. Okay. So fluid turbulence is hard because even this master equation, if we can prove it is the correct equation, it's already very hard to understand uh, phenomena like the energy spectrum. It's also very hard, even harder, to understand how to extract from this equation some stable structures like the one we saw in the movie before, or things you can see in nature, which are very nice, very beautiful to see, but how can that be extracted from this equation I just showed you? This looks really much too difficult and for the moment. So that's the reason why, or one of the reasons why, we could maybe just move back a tiny bit and say, let's study maybe a simpler problem, maybe it's not, maybe it is, which we call wave or sometimes weak turbulence. Okay, so that's what I'd like to explain now. Turbulence, fluid turbulence, uh, it's hard to define. We have some insight on what it means, but we don't know, at least from a mathematical point of view, have to explain it. So let's move back and try to study something which could be maybe a little bit easier, which is wave turbulence. So let me explain in the next uh, few minutes what I mean by wave turbulence. So I need to understand or to explain what a wave is. Okay, so let's go back to basics, cosines and sines. I mean, everything is, that's a building block of everything I'll be talking about today. So I think, I hope, I guess a lot of you, although I can't see you, I guess a lot of you know what a cosine or a sine is, or here they are uh, anyway depicted in front of you. Those are two periodic functions. The cosine is blue, the sine is red. They have uh, period two, two pi here. And so what you're counting here is how many times you see this picture here on a period. Of course, you only see it once. Sine x is, is periodic, two pi periodic. So you see this picture once, and then it's just repeated forever and forever for period two pi. Now, to double the period, what I'm going to do is replace sine x by sine two x. If I do that, I see 
that I reproduce twice the same uh, picture on zero two pi. So two X has, you see it twice on the same period, right? So it's oscillating more. And so I'll call the frequency the two here is the frequency, the more, uh, the larger the frequency, the more oscillations I have, right? So sine two X is oscillating twice as much as sine X. Now, what happens if I take, for instance, a cosine and I take a product of two cosines? Well, you have this nice formula which tells you that the cosine squared is essentially oscillating twice as much as cosine, right? You have a cosine squared S, you have a cosine 2X here in the formula. You've lost the fact that it's average zero. Okay, that doesn't really matter here, but you see it's oscillating twice as much. So if you take a product of, an, of two fun functions that are, are oscillating, the product will oscillate it more, okay, essentially. What you can do is take more and more of those things, cosine squared, three, four, make polynomials of cosines and sines. And because of such formulas, actually a trigonometric, trigonometric polynomial is actually written as a sum of cosine kx and sine kx, right? Not sine to the k, but sine kx, because of those uh, formulas I showed you before. And so such a function, if you give me uh, n cosines, n uh, sines with uh, frequencies one, two, three, up to n, they're going to oscillate more and more. So this is a typical example of a uh, trigonometric uh, polynomial, okay, just uh, randomly chosen. And you see it's, a, it's oscillating very much. And so those uh, cosines and sines are telling you the frequency of your function. And the idea of Fourier was to say that essentially, so this is not totally correct, but essentially any function can be written up as a sum of cosines and sines. So of course that sum has to be no longer finite, but infinite. Of course, there are some assumptions on F, which I won't be giving you um, right now, but what we're interested in when we're doing wave turbulence is precisely that, writing down a function, counting how much it oscillates. So how can you do that? How can you extract from a function F those coefficients a, k, and b, k, well, there are formulas for that. So if you give me f, I can find those coefficients a, k, and b, k just by averaging f against this cosine and this sine. Okay, it's just a formula. So if you know what, uh, for what values of k's, those a, k's, and b, k's are not zero, you know exactly how your function is oscillating. Okay, the highest the k, the larger the k, the more oscillatory your function is. Okay, to make things a tiny bit uh, more tractable, uh, I'll just change a little bit uh, the way of writing things and change my cosines and sines for exponential functions, which are easier to, to manipulate. And so F now for the rest of the talk, or almost, I prefer to write it down as a sum of exponentials, complex exponentials, e to the ikx, okay? And so K here is called the wave number. So when you give me a function f, I can always write it down, or almost always, if it has the correct um, assumptions, but we won't go into this now. I can write it down as a sum, an infinite sum in general, of exponential i, k, x. And whenever c, k is not zero, then the corresponding k is part of the oscillatory uh, properties of f, okay? So that's the Fourier transform of a function f. Now let's move on to waves. What's a wave? So let's talk about linear waves. So you're given an equation, so that's uh, physics gives me an equation on a function for like of phi, uh, psi, sorry, here. And so it's a time derivative of psi plus an operator w, which is linear, psi is equal to zero. That's an equation given to, given to me by physics. An operator is something which I feed him a psi and it gives me w psi, okay? And it's linear, meaning if I feed psi one plus psi two, it gives, it gives me W of psi one plus psi two, which is the same as W of psi one plus W of psi two. If I double psi, W of two psi is twice W psi. This is a linear operator, okay? So physics will give me that W. I'll give you examples later on. And now what's a wave? A wave is what we call an eigenmode of W, meaning a special function phi, which exists or not, such that if I apply that operator w to phi, what comes out is just a number, here it will be a an imaginary number, i omega times phi, okay? So for this function phi, that, it's not for any function of course, but for this special function phi, w acts just like a multiplication. So are there examples of that? Yes, let's give a very easy example. Imagine your operator w is just the derivative. I give you psi 
W eats Psi and gives you Psi prime back. Okay, the derivative of Psi, I mean, one space dimensions, dimension. So for example, a good function Phi would be precisely e to the i k x. If you feed W this Phi, what do you get? Well, you get i k times W, times Phi, sorry. So W Phi is i, I k times Phi, because I take the derivative in x. And so if I look at this formula here, I see that, double, that omega is exactly k. Okay, so that's an example where you have found modes or waves for this operator w, which was upside prime, all the waves are given by those complex numbers. Okay. Now, if I give you this equation here, and I assume my initial data for this equation is precisely a wave, one of those phi's. What happens? Well, then I can very easily compute the solution, which is given by this formula here. Okay, just check it works. So that's great. A wave is a very easy way of solving the equation because the solution is explicit. It's just given by this formula here. And omega will be called a dispersion relation. If you give me w, I can compute omega, often precisely thanks to the Fourier transform. In all the examples I'll give you, it's exactly like that will do uh, the work. Okay, and then the solution of my general equation will be written as a superposition of those waves. Let me give again an example my favorite example, take the derivative, then we know that any function can be written as a sum of those guys, right? So I can write down my initial data, psi zero, as a superposition of those exponentials. And then following this formula here I gave you for the solution, I know exactly what the solution of my equation is, right? It's just a sum of the exponentials where uh, x has been shifted by t, okay? So that's just a, an easy example, but that's a very general procedure. So here are some, some very well-known examples from physics, the wave equation, you can uh, invent also bar waves, uh, KDV, or the Schrodinger equation, which will be my model equation here today. Okay, so the Schrodinger equation is written here. So it's I dt psi, time derivative, minus the Laplacian in one space I mentioned, that means I'm taking just two derivatives of psi in more space um, um, dimensions, I'm taking two derivatives in each direction and summing everything. So if you compute omega, when I have one derivative, it was k. If I take two, two derivatives, I get k squared. Okay, so this is uh, the equation I'll be uh, showing a little bit more in the following. The example of which I want to study to study wave turbulence. So what you notice uh, with the Schrodinger equation, again, is that since I knew that my uh, dispersion relation was k squared, by the previous formula we saw before, the solution is exponential of i omega k squared t times initial data for each wave number, right? So then I can just sum over all my wave numbers and I have an explicit solution to my Schrodinger equation, okay? What I notice here, and just, it's just a comment right now, is that you notice that the modulus of psi k is a constant in time, right? So the energy, that's the energy I'll be interested in, the, E of k we saw before in the um, when I saw when I, was, when I was talking about the energy cascade. Here you see there's no cascade at all. Everything is constant. The energy on each mode is constant in time. But that's not so interesting. It's a linear equation. Let's move to nonlinear equations. So I'll be talking today only about weakly nonlinear interactions. Meaning I have this nonlinear function here. I'll give examples later on, and I'll just multiply it by epsilon. Epsilon is very small, and I want to know what happens to this equation. Okay, so the question is, if I have a mode, a wave, like we saw before, now I have this nonlinear term, so I have to see how two waves are going to interact through this nonlinear term. So what we saw at the beginning of this, uh, this uh, part here is that a cosine squared can be written as one half of one plus cosine two x, remember? So this is very general. If you take a wave alpha, one with beta, then the, pr the product will be a sum actually of cosines where the frequencies are either the sum or the difference of the original frequencies. Okay, so if I have interactions of two waves like this, this will give me actually new waves, one with uh, frequency alpha plus beta and the other one alpha minus beta. Let's give an example. Pretend my first wave it's cosine x. What happens if I multiply cosine x by cosine 10x? Okay, so cosine x is very nice, just one oscillation on zero two pi. Cosine 10x, you have 10 oscillations. What happens if I do the product? This is what comes out. 
So you have a function which is highly oscillating, just about as much as cosine 10x. But the difference, of course, is that the, its amplitude now is very different. What you notice is that the amplitude of this product looks a lot like the amplitude of cosine x. Okay, so if I take two waves, a cosine with a small frequency, one, times a cosine with a large frequency, 10, what I get is something which is highly oscillating, but inside an envelope, which is slowly oscillating. Okay, so you see different scales appearing. As soon as you have two waves interacting, you have a slow scale, which is the, the smaller frequency. And inside this slow, slow scale, you have very fast oscillations. Okay, that's what happens if you just have two waves interacting. Okay, so that's again, it's related to the fact that, which we see easily here, the exponential of i alpha plus beta is the product of exponential i alpha, exponential i beta. More generally, if I have a wave k1 and a wave uh, number k2, I do the products, I'll get a wave number k1 plus k2, right? So now, how do I understand how modes interact? Well, I know exactly how modes interact. If I have two modes, k1 and k2, they're going to produce a mode k. Okay, so if my nonlinear term here is quadratic psi times psi, I'm going to get a mode k if I have a mode k1 interacting with a mode k2. So that's one thing I have to keep in mind. Now, what's the energy? Remember the energy we saw just before was psi k squared. When the, when the equation is linear, if you have no nonlinear term, this is constant. What happens if you have a nonlinear term? Then even if initially this guy is zero, because of the interaction, suddenly you, you're gonna have a non-zero factor here, okay? So the energy will be transferred from some modes to others through this interaction here. How can I understand this? Well, if you wanna understand an energy cascade, we saw in the experiments I showed you very briefly, from the pictures that it doesn't always happen, but probably in some kind of average way. So can we understand the average in some sense, which we have to, we would have to, to define of this uh, energy? If it's too hard to understand how the energy is really transferred, can we average it and then see what happens? How can we do that? And the other imp important thing to understand is at what time scale should we look at things? Because of this example here I showed you before, you see that time scales are very different. If you look at the linear time scale, then it's all those highly oscillatory things that are important from a linear level, right? That's just a linear solution. From a nonlinear uh, time scale, you see that this is also very important, right? That's the envelope. So how can we extract the different uh, time scales to understand what's interesting here? So for example, uh, that's a picture taken from someone of the Nicolas Mordon, I think, of our group in the Simons collaboration. That's a real experiment. That's really what happens. If you take a vibrating plate, you have a plate, you make it vibrate, and you compute Fourier modes. And you see that you have things that are oscillating very, very, very strongly, but you still have this very large amplitude. And this we want to understand. I don't think we're interested in what's happening at a very, very high, fine scale here. What we'd like to understand is what is this profile? That's wave turbulence. Okay, can we understand the different time scales and extract from the equation those amplitudes, the equation for the amplitude? Can we do that? Okay, so let me give uh, an example. Assume that your nonlinear term is uh, cubic, psi times psi times psi, just to work out something uh, on an example together. Sorry, so let's see. Uh, let's take the Fourier transform, okay, that we've learned that that's a good thing to do. So uh, I write down my solution as modes, right? And then I have those in front of the modes, it's amplitude psi k of t, and I want to know what equation that psi k of t satisfies. Well, I've been told that if I want to know the mode k of the nonlinear term, I have to look at the interactions. Now I have a th uh, three terms, so I have k1 plus k2 plus k3, that will produce k, okay? So the mode number k is actually obtained if I multiply psi mode k1 times psi k2 times psi k3. Okay, so those three modes are feeding psi k. Even if initially you have no psi k, for this k you have zero, immediately you'll have something because of those guys here. Okay, so that's an equation for each of the modes. Here it is again. Now, one thing you can do is get rid of this uh, linear term by multiplying by this exponential, that's just uh, just to make it a bit easier. And this is the equation you get in the end. 
Okay, so this new function, which is essentially also a wave, satisfies a very easy equation. Its time derivative is epsilon times this thing here. Now let's stop for a second and maybe make a small computation to understand what's going on. Assume you have something like, uh, let me make this much simpler. Assume you're looking at dt phi k is equal to epsilon. And then this huge sum, I'm just going to replace it by only one oscillation. Okay, so exponential i alpha t. Okay, and alpha, assume it's not zero, which is a typical example of this, right? Just the easiest thing you can come up with. I've taken all those guys equal to one and then just one oscillation here, okay? So what's good with that example is that I'm, I'm able to integrate this equation uh, in front of you, although it's very late because this is not so hard. Okay, so assume your initial data is zero, then you can compute phi k of t. And if I'm not mis mistaken, you'll get something like epsilon over i alpha, and please Jalal, I'll tell me if I'm wrong, e i alpha t minus one. Is that correct? Yes, I think it's good. Right, so I have a, a, a very nice solution. I can compute it exactly. What you see, it's, it's, it's oscillating. It's a very small amplitude, but it's just an oscillatory function and nothing's gonna happen. It stays bounded for all times, it's great. Okay, now assume that alpha is zero, just for a change. Okay, if alpha is zero, which means I have no oscillations at all, then I can again solve this equation. It's even easier actually, because I have dt phi k is equal to epsilon. So that's really easy to solve. And I get phi k of t if initially I'm zero, which is epsilon t, right? And so you see for small times, the solution stays very small, phi epsilon, but as time grows, this is growing linearly. So if time is of size one over epsilon, phi k gets of size one. Okay, so those two equations are actually very different if time is large, okay? And so what looks important in this example here is that actually the alpha equal to zero case is more important in some sense because the solution is going to grow, okay? So that's the, the main part of the, of the solution is this part here, okay? If you're summing between alpha equal to zero and alpha not equal to zero, I have, the, I have two terms in the equation, the most important term will be that one for large times, right? the first one will just be of size epsilon forever. That means that what you're interested in actually in large times for this equation is what happens when this term here is equal to zero. That's the most important part of the equation because of this example. It's not a proof, it's just an example. So if you believe me, then you believe that what's important in this equation is what happens on resonances. Resonances are exactly saying, on the one hand, you need to have those modes to sum up to k, okay? And the other hand, you need this term here to be equal to zero. That's a resonance set, okay? Now, if you believe me, then the question, you just take this equation and now sits on the resonances because it kills a lot of terms and it's supposed to be the most important. And now I want to understand the energy spectrum. So I want to understand what the average of the energy of each mode is doing. And this I won't do because it's much too hard for me and for a lot of people, I think, but I'll just show you the equation that we hope to find, we expect to find. So what you're gonna suppose is that, I won't go into the details here, we can discuss that later on, is that modes are independent in some sense, okay? In that case, if they are independent, then you can prove, at least uh, formally, this is what comes out, but there's no theorem actually proving this in a rigorous way to my knowledge, is that for um, the cubic Schrodinger equation. So cubic is what we just saw before. And now I take for the uh, omega will be k squared, okay? Then for the cubic uh, Schrodinger equation, this energy spectrum, if you've averaged correctly, converges to the solution of what we call a kinetic equation, okay? And all you want to remember about this kinetic equation is that it's sitting on those resonances. So it's a little bit different to, from the resonances I wrote before, just because there's a story of complex numbers where I don't want to get into it, but essentially exactly the resonance set I gave you before. Okay, so it's a very nice equation. If you want to understand the energy spectrum, you look to, uh, for stationary solutions to that equation, you get nice power laws. It's a very nice equation to be studied and a lot of people have studied it, but it's not clear to understand why the original Schrodinger equation does converge in the sense to this kinetic equation, but that's wave turbulence. Understanding such an equation is part of wave turbulence, okay? But it's hard to prove a theorem. Why is it hard? Because you have to study those resonances and studying resonances means studying, studying surfaces. Will they 
cross or not, where, how, and even if they do cross, then, then maybe, so that alpha will be zero. What happens if alpha is almost zero, but not quite zero? So that's quasi resonances. It gets very, very hard to do mathematically. That's the first problem. And the other problem is I told you without defining it at all, that you have to assume somewhere some kind of random phase approximation. I mentioned that, that word, how you prove it, hard to tell. Okay, so for the moment, uh, to my knowledge, uh, I hope I, uh, I'm not saying things uh, too wrong, there is no theorem giving this uh, uh, kinetic equation for the correct time scales we'd like to get. Okay, so again, it's too hard. So what I'll try to do now is show you on a, a more tractable examples, although it's also a little bit difficult, called particle interactions. This time, not waves, just particles. I'll try to see what can be done, what has been done, and how maybe what we understand on particles could help uh, in understanding the kinetic wave equation, for instance. Okay, so I think there won't be any more Fourier or anything now, it's just particles, and we want to extract from particles a kinetic equation and see what can be said about it. Maybe if I stop for a second, Jalal, are there any questions for the moment, or are we okay? Okay. So let's move on to particles. So we've, we've seen this model before. Um, this is my typical particle system. I have lots and lots and lots of particles, 10 to the 24. They're all going in straight lines and sometimes they collide, okay? Quite often actually. And when they collide, you can compute the velocities coming out from the velocities coming in or the other way around, it's, uh, it's the same. So you don't want to remember this formula at all. Maybe all you can maybe remember is that uh, collisions here are elastic. So when two particles collide, their momentum is exchanged, well, it's conserved, sorry, and the energy is conserved. Okay, so it's an elastic model. Look at a, imagine you have a huge billiard ball, a uh, billiard table, maybe in three space dimensions with a lot of balls and they're all going in straight lines and hitting themselves constantly. What's known in some sense is that the master equation hidden behind that equation is the Navier-Stokes equation. And one big question, which was uh, actually asked by Hilbert uh, in 1900, is to prove a convergence theorem in some sense from the particle system to the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay, is there a way of doing that? Well, uh, one way of doing that is moving to a kinetic equation, just like the one we saw before. The kinetic equation will be written down on the, the, the what I call a distribution function f, which depends on t, x, and v which roughly is telling you how many particles or what the density of particles are, which have at time t velocity uh, v and position x. Okay, so I wanna know how many uh, particles have this position and this velocity at a given time. And this uh, function f satisfies the Boltzmann equation. So this is the second equation I'll show you today. You saw Nadia Stokes, now you see Boltzmann. Two very, very important equations. If you've never seen it before, you might be uh, shocked, but I'll just try to explain to you in a few seconds how, how it goes. The right hand side, the left hand side, sorry, here is a transport equation. It's telling you that a particle with position X and velocity V is moving in a straight line with velocity V. That's all it's telling you, this is telling you, okay? The right hand side is telling you that particles collide, they have binary collisions, so I have a quadratic term here, F times F. A particle of velocity V, might hit a particle of velocity w for any w, so you integrate against any w here. And so you're gonna lose the particle of velocity v since by colliding, its velocity is changing. So you have a minus sign here. What can also happen is that a particle of velocity v prime hits a particle of velocity w prime with this relation, which is the scattering relation we saw before. And that will create a particle of velocity v. And so you have a plus sign here. Okay, so this is the Boltzmann equation. Alpha here is the collision rate. If alpha is very, very large, that means you have a lot of collisions in some sense. If alpha is zero, there are no collisions. So this is the Boltzmann equation. You don't have to remember it at all. If you want to remember anything, remembering those um, conservation rules, then you can check very easily that this equation conserves mass, momentum, and energy. By the way, maybe you've recognized here my resonance set. Remember the resonances? That's exactly, in some sense, the resonance set, right? K1 plus K2 is K3 plus K4. So this equation is a kinetic equation. 
It's quadratics, not exactly the same as my previous kinetic equation, but it's exactly sitting on a very similar resonance set as the Schrodinger equation. This equation uh, dissipates entropy, so you can check that at least formally, that if you take the time derivative of f times the logarithm of f, this is negative, non-positive, which is sort of an issue because that means if this is not zero, it's really negative actually, that means that your equation is irreversible. If I change time, the minus will become a plus. Okay. Whereas the original particle system was, re was time reversible. So the difference between Boltzmann and particles is quite subtle because you're going from a reversible equation to an irreversible equation. So it can't be so obvious to go from one to the other. We might be talking about that a bit later on. So I told you that uh, the Navier-Stokes equation is supposed to be the master equation for my particle system. Um, so it is known actually that in some sense, I will be giving uh, theorems here, but as the collision rate goes to infinity, if you wait for a long time, so you wait for a time of, of the order of alpha, and alpha is very, very large, then essentially the mass energy, well, the mass and uh, velocity and energy associated to the Boltzmann equation will converge to quantity satisfying the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, so Navier-Stokes is a limit of the Boltzmann equation, in a sense we can discuss later on if you want. So that's good news. That's what Hilbert was asking for. So now the question is, is the Boltzmann equation a limit of the particle system? If it is, then in some sense, if you can commute your limits, then Navier Stokes will be a limit of the particle system. So can we go from particles to Boltzmann? So there's one reason which is, then if we could do that, then we could go from particles to Navier Stokes, that would be nice. The other reason related to this talk today is that Boltzmann is a kinetic equation with resonances, which look, looks a lot like the wave kinetic equation in some sense. So if we can understand this limit here, maybe we can go back to the wave equation, to the wave turbulence problem and understand that better. Okay, so that's another reason why we want to understand this. So what do we do? We take the number of particles n, let it go to infinity. With a scaling on the size of the particles, this scaling roughly is telling you the following thing. If you take a particle of diameter epsilon, okay, and let it run for a while in a straight line, what's the probability that this particle is going to hit another one? Well, how many other particles are there? There are n minus one, okay? And the size of this tube here is epsilon d minus one if my velocity is one and I'm looking at that in time one. So the probability, if I want this particle to hit alpha particles in time t, that means that this should be of size alpha. Okay, that's, the, uh, that's a way of understanding the scaling. So if you do the limit n goes to infinity with this scaling written here, then you do converge, I'll show you why in a second, to Boltzmann. Unfortunately, on a very, very small time, that's a theorem due to Lanford in 74, the time is one over alpha. If you want to go to, Bo to Navier-Stokes, remember alpha has to go to infinity, so that's why we can't go from particles to Navier-Stokes because this goes to zero. But that's not the problem today. Today, we just want to understand this limit here. We're gonna set alpha equal to one if we want. Okay, and we just want to understand how to go from particles to the kinetic equation. So how do you do that formally? Well, let's look first at the n particle distribution function. That's telling me exactly what the density of particles have, what, what density of particles have exactly the positions x1, xn, I have n particles here, and velocities v1, vn. And this satisfies a transport equation because my particles are going in straight lines. The only difficult problem with this uh, transport equation is that since my particles aren't allowed to overlap, then it's written down in a domain, with this domain here, right? So I have to put boundary conditions. My boundary conditions are just saying that if my, my velocities are outgoing, then I have to replace them by incoming velocities at the collision point. Okay, so I have this easy transport equation with a sort of complicated boundary conditions. Now, if I want to find a, a kinetic equation, I have to do some averaging. What we're going to do here is average out against all particles except for one. Okay, let me call that particle one, x1, v1. Okay, so I take this distribution function, I average it out against every one except for one. And the claim is, this quantity here, which only depends on two variables now, x1, v1, satisfies in the limit the Boltzmann equation. Why is that true? Well, what you do is you take your transport equation, 
integrate it out against all variables here and see what happens. This is an exercise you can try to do. I won't do it in front of you because I get it You're totally messed up. But if you if you commute in, in some way the integral here and the derivative here, what you get is a transport equation that's easy, 1fn1, and a collision term, which is telling you exactly the following thing. Particle number two, well, it could be any particle. I have n minus one possibilities here. Let's say particle number two is sitting just next to particle number one. That's a collision. Okay, this epsilon d minus one is just the size of the sphere of, di of diameter epsilon. So I'm integrating over here the sphere of, of size one. I multiply and divide by alpha because it looks nice. And then this is exactly what you get. This is a computation, nothing, nothing very fancy here. Okay, now I remember the boundary condition is telling me if my velocities are going out, I should change them. That means this quantity is positive. I should exchange them by incoming velocities. This is what's done here. Either this is positive and I exchange V1, V2 by V prime, V prime one, V prime two, or it's negative and I don't do anything. Okay, so it's just uh, using the boundary condition. And now I'm told to take the limit and goes to infinity. Before doing that, I had this plus here and minus here. I don't like that. I prefer putting a plus here, which means I change omega into minus omega, which I did here. And here's my formula. Now, this is just a formal der derivation of the Boltzmann equation. Take the limit and going to infinity with this constraint here uh, on n epsilon d minus one. Where does n appear or epsilon? Those red terms. Formally take the limit. The first one here is going to one and the two others are going to zero formally, so I get this. Now what do I do? Well, now what I notice, what I'm going to assume for a second, you could assume it's like the random phase approximation. I'm going to assume that things are independent, meaning that the, that the two-point correlation function here is actually a product of two times the same function f, a tensor product. Okay, that's a little bit like the RPA. If you assume that, then just compute things, you get exactly the Boltzmann equation. Exactly. Okay, that's an assumption I've made. So of course I have to prove this, this is true, if not, I haven't done anything. But if you assume that, then you get the Boltzmann equation for free. To make this into a proof, uh, well, you have to work hard and that's what uh, Lanford did in 1974. He told you the following thing. Assume initially you have this chaos, random phase in the kinetic, uh, in the wave turbulence uh, situation. Here it means, my particles are independent initially, then it is true that Fn1 converges to the solution of the Boltzmann equation, okay? At least for a small time. And it is true that the two particle and all the others actually correlation functions converges to the product, the tensor product of the solution of the Boltzmann equation. It's a theorem, it's not an assumption, okay? So for a short time, you have propagation of chaos, it's proved, and you converge to the Boltzmann equation. So, Averaging means actually, I don't know the, uh, exactly where each particle is. It's just given by this F0, a function. So it's averaging in terms of where my particles are. I can also average if I like on uh, the number of particles, but I won't uh, do that right now. And so we do find that the Boltzmann equation is the master equation. Okay, so now questions. We had asked at the very beginning, uh, large deviations. What happens if I don't get Boltzmann? What happens? Is that possible? And how much does it cost? Can we quantify that? Can we qu quantify maybe before that fluctuations around the Boltzmann equation? How far am I from the Boltzmann equation? Can we understand anything that looks like the energy cascade I told you about? Now that I have the, the kinetic equation, can I understand the energy cascade, which here would be an entropy cascade? And then if I want to get fluids, of course, can I get the one over alpha? Can I change it to get something better? So those are very natural questions. And maybe one even more natural question is where is the loss of information gone? Remember, Boltzmann is irreversible in time. My original system was reversible. Where is that gone? What, what happened? So this I can explain in a few minutes, uh, in a few seconds, actually. Uh, what uh, makes the Boltzmann equation the good limit? is that what I told you is that initially my particles are independent and at the limit when n goes to infinity, my particles are independent since I'm at a tensor product, right? The two point correlation function is actually a product of F times F, right? So that means that two particles that have seen each other at one point can't see each other again. If not, they would be cor correlated at collision and they're not allowed to. So if two particles see each other, they mustn't see each other again. That's what we call recollisions. 
you, that's just forbidden. And that's in the proof of the theorem, you have to say particles do not recollide. But when I say two particles collide and then recollide, I said, and then, if I say, and then, there is a narrow of time. Okay, if I move back, a recollision is a collision. Okay, well, the first recollision is a collision if I go backwards in time. So in the proof of Lanford's theorem, you can see very clearly that the proof itself is irreversible, okay? Because of this recollision um, procedure. That's just a comment, but uh, I think it's useful to understand something has happened and we sort of understand what's going on. Now, just to finish, I guess I just have four or five minutes. So I'll talk about a tiny bit about fluctuations and large deviations. So one way of understanding Lanford's theorem is a law of large numbers actually. Okay, so the kinetic equation you can see as a law of large numbers. Why is that? Well, way, one way of understanding this is, let's assume here my, the number of particles is not known. It's, I am also going to average the number of particles. Let me look at this empirical density. So if I apply this to the function h, I'm just summing h of z1 plus h of z2 plus blah, 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 h of zn, and dividing by the number of particles, essentially. You can translate very easily Lanford's theorem into the probability, probability in terms of the number of particles and my distribution at zero of the difference between this density and its expectation, which is given exactly actually by the integral of the at the limit of the sol of the Boltzmann equation times h. Okay, at the limit, this probability goes to zero. So really, it's a, an easy way of translating the Lanford's theorem. And so we're really saying that Lanford, uh, well, the Boltzmann equation is a lot of large numbers. So once you've understood that, you know exactly what a fluctuation should be. At least if you know a little bit of probability theory, you guess that a fluctuation should be of size uh, square root of your initial average, one over mu, right? So I had here one over mu, I should zoom in at a square root. That was usually the central limit theorem is telling you, and you should study this equation, the, the, this uh, fluctuation field. Okay, so that has been done recently. And you can see that this guy does converge at the limit to an equation, well, to uh, something satisfying an equation, which is stochastic, which is interesting in some sense. You start with a deterministic equation. The particle systems is purely deterministic. You converge to the Boltzmann equation, which is also deterministic, but the fluctuations are stochastic. Okay, and this, uh, it's a Gaussian field that sat uh, satisfies a, a what's known as a fluctuating Boltzmann equation, which has really a noise inside. Okay, and this noise is due to recollisions, and we could talk about it uh, more if you like. So that's the first thing that can be done for the um, particle system. And you can also study large deviations. I'm almost, almost done with this. You could wonder, okay, so Boltzmann is great. That's the right limit. But is it possible to catch something else? Okay, another function. What's the probability that my density here actually looks like another function phi, not at all my f, which I gave, gave you before the solution to the Boltzmann equation? Well, you can do that, and what you get is that um, it is exactly like the large deviation theorem. It's given by the exponential of minus mu, which is gigantic, right? Mu is going to infinity, it's one over epsilon d minus one, times a function f, and this is getting uh, technical, so I'll soon stop, but this function f is related to a hamilton jacobi equations. So it's a very beautiful equation, which I'll show you in a second, and then I'll really stop. And so this is uh, understood. Maybe I'll show you the equation right now. How do you do this? And I'll really stop now. Remember, we, I told you the Boltzmann equation was a lot of large numbers and you understood it by studying this uh, empirical distribution. Then I told you, if you want to understand fluctuations, you, you should multiply that by square root of mu. If you want to understand large deviations, you multiply that by mu, which is huge, right? Take the logarithm, divide by mu, and this gives you an exponential moment. And all you want to know about this guy is that at the limit, it's going to satisfy, in some sense, this hamilton jacobi equation. And this is exactly up to some transformation, uh, the um, large deviation functional. Everything is totally explicit. You can really compute it. And now for the last slide, before Jalal gets impatient, the last slide is going just to tell you one last thing about this uh, hamilton jacobi equation, which I like very much. I'd like to tell you about it is that to compute, and I really I stop here, to compute uh, this guy here, its limit is the, in some sense, the large deviation functional up to some transformation, okay? So this is very important. It's an important quantity. 
it's equal to, and I put some computations, this guy, and this is the last thing I want to talk about, this guy is what we call a cumulant, and it's telling you the departure to chaos in some sense, at every scale. If I take my initial data, all I know about uh, by my particles is that they're identically distributed. The only thing I know on top of that is that they're not allowed to touch each other, right? If they were totally independent, I wouldn't have this assumption. What's the difference between not touching each other and no assumption at all is, well, two particles can touch, or maybe three, or maybe four, or maybe five. If two touch, that's the uh, cumulant of order two. If three touch, cumulant of order three, four, five, six, etc. You can write down um, the fact that no particles touch each other as one minus two touch each other plus three touch minus four, blah, blah, blah. This Fn of t is exactly the same thing at the level of dynamics. It's telling you exactly if I give you n particles, this guy is telling you that those n particles will be correlated at some time between time zero and time t. Okay, this is a cumulant. And so cumulant number one converges to the Boltzmann equation, number two to the fluctuation uh, equation. And if you know all the cumulants and their size, then you get this hamilton jacobi equation. And if you know all the cumulants, then you're time reversible actually, and you really have lost no information. So our hope is that, I'll stop here, for the particle interaction situation, we understand the kinetic equation for short times, so it's not enough. But we also understand all the cumulants, so maybe at some time we'll be able to understand even some kind of entropy cascade because we feel that we haven't lost any information once we've understood all the cumulants. Why is it harder to go from particles to waves? Is that wave interactions are not localized in space. Right? Particle interactions, they hit and then they go and then you're done. K1 plus K2 is equal to K, that happens in a non-local way. Okay, so that's very hard. Then the gap between wave numbers, when I had my uh, resonance condition, I wanted to divide by this alpha or by the resonance set. If the box is larger and larger, the, the gap between those wave numbers shrinks and it's more and more hard to understand this resonance condition. That's a, another problem. And the most important problem probably to justify the kinetic wave equation, which we don't have for the Boltzmann equation, is finding the correct scalings in terms of the time scaling, nonlinear versus linear time scaling, in, time, in terms of space scalings because of those problems of the size between wave numbers, and even how strong the nonlinearity is. So for this, we need uh, help from people doing experiments. That's why in this uh, collaborate, uh, Simon's collaboration, it's very important to talk to mathematicians, numerics people, and physicists. So hopefully with all those uh, people, we'll be able to do something about that. And I'll finish there in a bit late, I'm sorry. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.